For several years, I had the privilege of teaching a class session for honors freshmen at St. Louis University. One of their honors professors attended the church where I served, and she did a series of classes every year on death and dying. She brought in her husband, who was an Iraq war veteran, and he talked about his experiences with death on the battlefield. She brought me in to discuss my experiences with funerals. And sadly, over the years, I have had some crazy funeral experiences. Uh, the murder of a man with a drug deal that had gone bad. Funerals for infants and toddlers. Funeral for a 16-year-old girl who had been shot by police officers. And I did the funeral with news cameras in the back of the room. It gave me the opportunity to speak to these young men and women about the difference that faith makes in handling death. Because faith in Jesus Christ is the differentiating factor between those who handle death well and those who do not. But one semester, a student asked me a profound and point blank question in front of the whole class. She said, so how do you reconcile a loving God and a suffering world? She said, it seems to me that if God really is good and loving, if God really is so powerful as you Christians claim, then either he doesn't want to help or he can't help because he's not powerful enough. So which is it? Very brilliant honors student. This is our issue, is it not? I mean, we believe these things about God, yet we look at the world around us and we see death. We see injustice. We see suffering. Does God not care? Is God not powerful enough to step in and do anything about it? This is the issue at the heart of Psalm 10. Right, let's review for a minute. We saw last week that Psalm 9 and 10 are linked, likely one long psalm. And Psalm 9 taught us that God sees, God helps, God remembers the oppressed. But what happens when we don't see that happening? What happens when it seems like the opposite of that is happening? When injustice prevails, when God is nowhere to be seen? Well, David now dives deeply into this topic so that we can wrestle with this reality. And he, he walks through for us phases that he goes through as he wrestles with the reality of sin and death in the world, phases that you and I go through as we settle this same issue in our hearts. So I'm gonna tell you where we're going. Here are the three phases that we'll walk through together that David walked through. First, there is confusion over God's silence. There's injustice happening. What do we do? Secondly, there's a call for God's salvation. And third, there's a confidence in God's sovereignty. Those are the phases we'll walk through together. So let's go to Psalm 10. We'll read it. We'll come back and work our way through it. Verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Yahweh? Why do you hide yourself in times of distress? In his lofty pride, the wicked hotly pursues the afflicted. Let them be caught in the thoughts which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his soul's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns Yahweh. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. And his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says in his heart, I will not be shaken. From generation to generation, I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses 
and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the places of the villages where one lies in wait. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lies in wait in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lies in wait to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Yahweh. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it. For you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Yahweh is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. Oh, Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will cause your ear to give heed, to give justice to the orphan and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. So let's walk through the phases together. He begins with confusion over God's silence. He begins verse one with this sudden lament. It's phrased as a direct question to God. Why do you stand afar off, O Yahweh? Now he's just concluded at the end of Psalm 9 that the wicked are going to receive divine justice, that the oppressed are going to be redeemed that God is going to powerfully show all these wicked nations that they are mere mortal men. But that's not what he sees when he looks at the wicked. There's wickedness all around, but what concerns him more is that God doesn't seem to be all around. So he questions God's absence, God's silence, and he goes on to describe the problem. It's one we've already seen in the Psalms, this theme of the way of the wicked versus the way of the righteous. And he now gives to us a definitive description of the wicked. Two characteristics drive the wicked. First, they're arrogant. The wicked are arrogant. Go back to verse two. In his lofty pride, the wicked hotly pursues the afflicted. Let them be caught in the thoughts which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his soul's desire. The greedy man curses and spurns Yahweh. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. And all his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says in his heart, I will not be shaken. And from generation to generation, I will not be in adversity. Such arrogance. Verse two, in his lofty pride. That description of the wicked is Darwinian to its core. This is the survival of the fittest in human form. The wicked hotly pursues. He, he burns ferociously and passionately to come after God's people. Now we'll see his motivation in a few minutes about why he comes after God's people. He says he's devised these schemes. So we're not talking about someone who stumbles into a sin and another person gets hurt. We're talking about something deliberate, something premeditated, very much on purpose. They've devised this scheme against God's people. The word is first used in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, to refer to the people at the Tower of Babel who were planning, devising on usurping God's authority. Verse three, he boasts of his soul's desire. He boasts in pleasure. His desires, his cravings are virtues. 
to him. I mean, doesn't success come from your will to win? Isn't it greed that gets you to the top? These carnal desires are to be celebrated. They're not to be avoided. They're not to be condemned. Celebrate those things. This is the path of the wicked. Any desire, no matter how heinous that desire may be, is to be applauded. Verse four, the haughtiness of his countenance. So the the arrogant is not just something that describes their actions, it describes their nature. They are arrogant. Therefore, they don't seek God and the posture of their life is, there is no God. He is inconsequential to me. I do whatever I want. Now, after reading this description of the nature and the actions of the wicked, what we want to read next is, and then God smote them. And then God broke the teeth of the wicked. He showed them tangibly that they are mere mortal, frail men. He blew them up. But that's not reality. Verse five, his ways prosper at all times. That's not what we want to read next. Not only are the wicked wicked, they are successful. Their way prospers. It means to be strong or sure. This is the strong way to live. This is the sure way to bring success. And God's judgments are on high. They're out of his sight, meaning if God does exist, it just doesn't matter. God's rules are inconsequential. They play no role. He snorts at his foes. And who are the wicked's foes? God's people and God. He snorts at them. The the sound of scorn, the sound of disgust. Verse six, he is so emboldened by his success in the world, I will not be shaken. I am unbeatable. Now, Psalm 15 and Psalm 16 that we'll get to in like 2045, (laughs) both state it's the blameless who will never be moved. It's the righteous that will be stable. Psalm 1-4, the wicked are chaff, They're blown by the wind. So isn't this our problem? God promises justice and judgment that the wicked are without substance and they're just blown around like nothing, but it's the righteous who will stand firm. And then we look at the world and we see the opposite of that. They're arrogant. Secondly, the wicked are aggressive. Go to verse seven. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the places of the villages where one lies in wait. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lies in wait in the hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lies in wait to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws them into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty one's And he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. Their aggression begins with words. Now, we want to think that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We want to think that's true. But we all know that it's not. Some of the most profound damage and worst forms of violence happen without any physical contact at all. Verse eight, he lies in wait. Again, this is premeditated. This is cold, this is calculated. Like a lion, he's stealthy. He's cunning. And he draws him into his net. He switches metaphors. Now it's like a hunter setting a trap. This is the result of their aggression. It works. Verse 10, the unfortunate fall. The wicked succeed. 
This is now how we see why the wicked target the oppressed. Because they can. Why would they act this way? Because they can. It doesn't seem that anybody is going to take up the case of the oppressed. No one's stopping them. The world applauds them. Apparently, even God doesn't seem to care. Verse 11, he remains convinced of his invincibility. He repeats verse 4, but now with more emphasis, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see it. So now he allows for God's existence. Verse 4, he says there is no God. But now the wicked says even if there is, he's not a God that intervenes. God doesn't remember. Contrary to what we learned in Psalm 9, the wicked has gotten away with this before, therefore they're going to get away with it now. So maybe God will not intervene, meaning he's not loving. Or maybe it's because God cannot intervene, meaning he's not powerful. So which is it? Boy, isn't this a terrible description of the wicked? I mean, not only are they so terrible, they succeed. And this is our dilemma. God has promised judgment and has not delivered. Listen to what Peter Craigie wrote. He said, it's easy to say that God exists, to affirm that morality matters, to believe in divine and human justice, but the words carry a hollow echo when the empirical reality of human living indicates precisely the opposite. The reality appears to be that the atheists have the upper hand, that reality really does not matter, and that justice is dormant. At the moment that this reality is perceived in all its starkness, the temptation is at its strongest to jettison faith, morality, and belief in justice. What good is a belief and a moral life which appear to be so out of place in the harsh realities of an evil world? Indeed, would there not be a certain wisdom in the oppressed joining ranks with the oppressors? And while that at times may seem like an attractive prospect, David continues, into the next phase, after we have this confusion that God has not acted and we don't know why he hasn't acted. Now, number two, the call for God's salvation. Verse 12, arise, O Yahweh. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you, and you've been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. God, I'm confused about your silence and your absence, that you would let something like this happen. So God, arise. Now we've seen this before. It's a call to God to go to war. God, they're winning. And if you don't intervene, they will continue to win. Lift up your hands. God, intervene. Do something. God needs to act against the wicked. Don't let this stand. God, do not forget. Again, it's a a reversal of the false assumption of the wicked. They think God will forget, but God does not forget. Verse 13, he, he asks this rhetorical question, why do they do this? Why would the wicked live in such fantasy? Oh God, their attack isn't just on your people. It's on you. Verse 14, you do see You're not blind to this. God, this isn't hidden from you. You're not hidden from this. You see it all. This is reality. God, you have been the helper. Past tense. Have been. 
that God's past actions prove who he is and prove how he will act in the future. God is consistent. God's character does not change. It's the doctrine of God's immutability, his unchanging nature. Verse 15, break the arm of the wicked. I mean, not literally, though we would like that. God destroy their power, bring down their strength, and God seek out his wickedness until you find it no more. Call this to account until it's eradicated from the land. That's quite a prayer. A prayer that you and I would do well to pray. God, it seems as if the wicked are winning. They are in power and they succeed. God, break their arm. God, bring them down to show them who they are. Which brings us to the final phase. Confidence in God's sovereignty. This is where it all comes down. Right here. This is the rub for us. God has made promises that we do not see the fulfillment of. From our vantage point, God has not delivered on them. And Psalm 1 launched us into the Psalms by declaring God's people prosper, God's people flourish. They're like trees planted by streams of water. Their leaves don't wither. There's always fruit to be produced. They're going to flourish. The wicked are dry chaff that are dead and blow around with the wind. Well, that sounds great, but our eyes see the opposite of that. What do we do with that? We look to God as the sovereign ruler who is orchestrating all of that to bring it to his desired conclusion. Verse 16, Yahweh is king. He trusts in God's ultimate rule, God's ultimate reign over all things, including the wicked. Forever and ever, Yahweh is king. The nations perish, though the wicked may be terrible. Though they wreak havoc in the world and in our lives, they are temporary. Their effects are temporary. God's reign is forever. Verse 17, you've heard the desire. Well, what's that desire? What's the prayer from verses 12 to 15? Break their arm. Bring down their stronghold. So God strengthen the heart of the oppressed. It means to establish or settle because we look at the world around us and it's easy for our hearts to grow unsettled. It's easy for our hearts to grow anxious. God and his sovereign rule settle the heart. Charles Spurgeon said the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the believer rests his head at night. This is how we move forward. This is how we rest. God is in charge. I can sleep. Verse 18, God give justice. Make this right. Vindicate. So that man who is of the earth, man, that great Hebrew word Enosh, frail, fragile man, who is of the earth, not God in heaven. They're not in charge. They think they are. They're not. God help them to see. They're not in charge and they are of no substance. This is the truth that gives hope. This is the truth that gives encouragement to the afflicted, to the believer. Those who come after you, those who wickedly rule and reign in the world are of no substance though they seem that they are. Though the world tells them that they are, they are dry chaff blown by the wind. And God is eternally established on his throne. Listen to Colossians chapter three, verse one. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, if you're a believer, if you're trusting Christ for salvation, 
Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. This issue, this problem of the wicked's apparent success, of God's seeming distance and apathy from justice, this is why God's people are people who look up and look forward. We look up because that's where Christ is. We look up to God's throne and Christ seated at the right hand, the seat of power, reminding ourselves the battle's already been won. The cross was a long time ago and that definitively settled. There is eternal justice and God wins. We look up. We look forward because that same Lord Jesus who rules and reigns from the right hand of the throne of God is coming. He will bring to the earth justice and ultimate reality. And that reality will be our reality forever. Revelation 22 carries this picture of heaven. Verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes They've been forgiven, cleansed, so that they may have the authority to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Those who have been forgiven by Christ get ushered into heaven and they get to live forever. Verse 15, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. This is the joy of heaven, friends. God's people are with him, and the wicked are outside. They don't get to come inside. They're not part of eternal reality with you. The Old Testament book of Habakkuk is my favorite minor prophet. Minor, not meaning inconsequential, but the minor prophets, the 12 of them that end your Old Testament, it's just because they're smaller books. Habakkuk is a prophet to read for today. He asks what David asks in Psalm 10. He cries out to God and he asks, God, why is evil happening in the world? We're your people. You've promised to bless us. You've promised to protect us. And I look around, and that's not what I see. Why is there evil? Why is there suffering? So God, I pose this question, he says, and now I'm gonna stand on the wall, and I'm gonna watch and wait for you to respond. Well, God is faithful. God responds. Do you know what God's response to him is? It's gonna get worse. Why is there evil and suffering in the world? Oh, you think that's bad now? You just wait. The world isn't going to get better. It will spiral and get worse. And for them in particular, it's because Babylon is coming. I'm bringing the Babylonians in and they will utterly obliterate you. And those that do happen to survive, they're gonna be carted off into captivity in a foreign pagan land. So that's my answer to your question, Habakkuk, which is really an unsatisfying answer. How do you respond to that? that there's wicked and evil in the world, but God isn't going to step in just yet and in fact is going to allow it to continue and get worse. Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. He says, behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Here's how I navigate this wicked world. I trust God. I don't know what he's up to, and I can't see all that he sees, but here's what I know. I know him, and I love him, and he is good, and he is righteous, and he is loving, and he is infinitely powerful, 
So really what happens around me, I'm just gonna not worry about that and I'm gonna trust in him. Habakkuk chapter three, verse 17. This is, friends, this is the way to live. Here's Habakkuk's final conclusion. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no produce on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in Yahweh. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Though the world around me is terrible, my eyes are on him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. It is comforting. Truth is encouraging. Because without it, we don't know what to make of the world around us. We don't know how to live in response. We don't know what to do. But we know you. And that is all that matters. So we trust you. And though the world around us give way, we rejoice in the God of our salvation. Which, as we do every week, we stop to remind ourselves that this is indeed what you've done, that you have already acted definitively for justice and for salvation. We take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and remind ourselves that Jesus satisfied justice, that he brought righteousness to your people and has declared the righteous will forever be established with you. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for us. It's in his name that we pray, amen.